realized that for some reason my um, camera isn't working, but I am here. Here's my little background. <laughs> anyway, so I'm Skylar with Lean Frontiers, and on the screen, we do have Kelly Mallory. Kelly will be joining us in Orlando during the Lean Coaching Summit in July. So if you guys would like to see her in person, please come and join us at the Lean Coaching Summit. I do, Kelly, it looks like we have kind of slowed down with people who are hopping on. So you can go ahead and start. Okay. Well, thank you again uh, for joining. So yeah, I'm, I'm Kelly. Um, a quick introduction of me. Um, I've been working in manufacturing for my entire career through a few different sectors. Right now, I work for GE Aerospace. Um, in the Rutland, Vermont facility um, as one of our, our lean coaches here. Um, so that's why I'm talking to you today about some micro skills for leaders and coaches. Um, I've also been practicing Kata for a few years, so that's where some of these are coming from as well, um, and helped found Kata School Northeast. So if you're interested and you're in the Northeast, check us out as well. Uh, so that's what we're going to dig into today are some of the key micro skills that I've learned over the last several years through my leadership and coaching experience. And I wanted to share five of those with you today. So with that, we're gonna just dive right in uh, to skill number one, which is how to ask why without asking why. So, right, asking why is a great method for getting to the root cause of a problem. But in a lot of situations, people aren't really great with how they respond to being asked why, especially in one-on-one -on -one situations where you're asking about something that a, a person might have a particular attachment to um, and is not necessarily as focused or as process focused. So in this kind of situation, when you ask why, uh, the other person can start putting up a defensive wall, which gets in the way of that problem solving. So instead of asking why, you can substitute what and how questions. So these help prevent that defensive wall from being built in the first place. Some example questions are like, what happened? How should this process run? How did you know to do that? Right, anything that can take that why question and transform it into a what or how helps kind of mitigate that defensiveness that, that can come up sometimes when you just keep asking why, why, why. Uh, so, right, the next time, that you need to get to root cause of a problem and you're used to going down the five why route, I would practice substituting that why question for a what or a how and see what happens to, to the conversation and the defensiveness. So that's skill one. So then skill two is repeat and add. So this is one of my personal favorite micro skills um, and it is probably the one that I use the most. So we're gonna spend a little extra time on this one. So repeat and add is used when you are coaching somebody or interacting and you're looking for a minimum amount of information about something and you don't immediately get that needed information with the first question you might ask. And you know, you, you can definitely just tell the person or explain why you're looking for that information. But this situation in a coaching conversation can get really tangled easily. Um, and when you tell or explain, it disrupts the flow of that coaching. And so this skill kind of helps mitigate and get through that really quickly. This skill is also really useful um, when a person that you're coaching goes off topic. So you ask a question and they, they don't answer your question. They kind of veer off into a different direction. I know I've seen that happen a lot. Um, and so this is a method that you can use also to kind of gently bring them back to the topic that you are talking about at hand. So with that out of the way about like when to use this, here's how repeat and add works. So all you have to do is you take the original question you asked and you add the information that you're missing, or you can add a constraint on the conversation such as time, topic, or data formatting or any other constraint. So in this example, um, when I'm asking, what do you expect? I might be looking for, what does this person expect to learn from this experiment? So my first question of just, what do you expect? If that didn't yield the answer I'm looking for, then I'll use repeat and add to include what I am looking for from them. 
So I would then say, okay, what do you expect to learn? So another example of this is when you wanna bring that person back on topic. So this situation, you can add something like, what is happening now with respect to whatever topic you're working on? So this might be a situation where I'm asking, hey, what's happening now when we're talking about a quality defect? So if I say what's happening now with respect to this defect we're talking about, that helps gently bring them back to the topic at hand in your desired area of focus. Another example of how to use repeat and add is when you're in a situation where you need action faster, uh, you can also use repeat and add to add a time constraint. Like what is the next step today? So this can help drive home the need for action to be taken today, as opposed to either, you know, give me a week or two weeks. So if you're in a situation where you're asking what's next and somebody is responding with, well, I'm gonna need a few weeks, you can use repeat and add to say, okay, great. What is the next step today? Like, what can we do today with respect to this? And then another example, so there's so many repeat and add examples, is if somebody is bringing you data that has been averaged over a period of time, or it doesn't really show you what you're looking for as far as like trends and um, patterns, then what you can do is ask, instead of just what does this look like, you would do repeat and add to say, what does this data look like in individual data points or in numbers or in a run chart? Um, so those are all of the different methods that you can use repeat and add. And this micro skill, really simple in its execution and really powerful, which is why I use it so much in my day-to-day -day coaching and why I've given so many different examples of this. So that was skill number two, repeat and add. So then coming to skill number three, uh, slicing the elephant. So this is another skill that helps get people faster to action. Um, and this is used when a person that you are working with has a very large task in front of them that they say is going to take several days or weeks or months to complete. And you need to get the ball rolling and get some immediate action. So slicing the elephant um, can also be helpful in a situation where somebody is maybe overwhelmed or paralyzed by the amount of work ahead of them or this large task and they just don't know where to start. So this is all about slicing this big old elephant, this big old task or project into bite-sized bits. Um, so it's really simple, just like repeat and add is really simple. And this actually pairs nicely with that repeat and add skill. So when someone responds with an action or task taking them a long time or with uncertainty about how to begin, you can help them by start asking about the first step um, or what can you do today to begin, right? So this helps them break down that giant elephant into, okay, well, what has to happen first and then second, or what could we do to start um, so that they can, right, slice that to be able to get that thing going quicker because nobody can eat a whole elephant in one go. So this is skill three, slice the elephant. So then coming to skill four, contrasting. So this is a little bit different um, in nature then than the previous few that we've talked about. So this skill is for when your coaching has maybe rubbed somebody the wrong way. Um, and this happens to us all, uh, where what we intended to, to say comes across very differently, uh, and the other person might get defensive or upset. So when this happens and you see it, which is a, a first step, can you actually see that this has happened? Um, you can use contrasting to help smooth that conversation and maintain that relationship. So here's, here's how this works. Uh, with respect to whatever has gone wrong in your, in your coaching or conversation, um, or with whatever you said that has rubbed the other person the wrong way, you first state what you are not trying to do or say, and then you contrast it with what you are trying to do or say. So for example, I'm not trying to downplay all of the hard work you've done here. I am trying to ensure that the, your solution is really hitting the root cause and not just a symptom, all right? So that's contrasting what you are not trying to do with what you are trying to do to help bring clarity to why you're maybe going down a certain line of questioning. Um, this skill, I will admit, 
Uh, also very helpful in difficult conversations of all varieties, and I may be guilty of using this at home from time to time too. So this is really handy in any kind of challenging uh, relationship or conversation as well. So again, right, the contrast is I am not saying or trying to do this, but I am trying to say or do this. Okay, so I've got quite a bit of time left for this last one because this skill is really, really important. Uh, so skill five is understanding when to teach versus when to coach. Uh, this is probably one of the most important skills and one that I've personally experienced not getting right several times. Um, so when I transitioned into a leadership role, uh, I was really excited to, to get to practice and demonstrate servant leadership and coaching. Um, and what this, what this did was it meant that I saw every conversation as a nail needing my coaching hammer, uh, which is not good. And it took me a lot of time and some, uh, some seriously wonderful feedback to help me see that this is what I was doing and that me coaching all the time was actually alienating my people from me. So that's what it took for me to recognize this problem. So I really want to talk about this here that there is a time and a place for both of these. So first quick level setting, right? Teaching is kind of telling or showing somebody how to do something where coaching is when you ask an open-ended question to help the other person find their own answer, right? So when you are in a coaching conversation, right? You're, you're asking those questions. And in some situations, you will come across a, a point in time where you need to transition away from just asking those questions to helping and teaching the other person. So let's look at how do you actually know? How do you know when to stop coaching and then move to teaching, right? How do you know when to stop doing this, asking those questions and move to helping and helping? So a few things. A person you're asking is really frustrated, or they said they don't know, maybe multiple times, or they've already tried to figure it out on their own. Those are three things that I have come to see and understand with coaching conversations as key indicators that, ooh, okay, I, I need to back off of the coaching throttle and start helping and teaching here now. And of course, right, every interaction every person that you're dealing with is going to have different indicators, but these are just some generic ones that more than likely you'll be able to use to at least initially gauge, okay, where are they right now? Can I, can I continue coaching with them or do we need to go back and, you know, help and start teaching? So get to know the people you're working with and coaching um, and understand their thresholds and levels as far as what they can tolerate and take as far as how much you coach versus teaching. So those are the skills. and I'm going to go back through them quickly and hopefully give a little memory trigger for each of these. Uh, so those five micro skills that we covered, and they are micro, they're very little, is the first one, how to ask why without asking why, right? Ask those what and how. Number two, how to get at the information you need with repeat and add. Number three, how to help break down a large task into small action, slice the elephant. Four, how to mend a misstep with contrasting. And then five, how to tell when people need, when you need to transition from coaching to teaching. All right, so again, let's go through again, right? Number one, why with no why, so ask what and how questions. Two, repeat and add, so if you don't get the information, repeat the same question, add what you need, add a constraint, add whatever is gonna help you get there with them. Number three, slice the elephant, right? What can we do first? What can we do to start? just help get started. So you slice that elephant into small bite-sized chunks. Then contrasting, right, with that misstep, hey, I'm not trying to say or do this, but here's what I am trying to say or do. And then teach versus coach, right, look for that frustration, look for I've, I've tried this before, I'm getting stuck, um, or that, that wonderful response of I don't know multiple times. That's the other signal to switch from coaching to teaching. So then with that, I would invite, let's go practice, right? Go out and practice these. These are little things that you can go out and immediately just start taking note of. 
and start trying. Just try them. Try them with your people. Try them with your teams, with your coaching conversations, and see what happens. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, does anybody have any questions? You can send them in through the Q&A or the chat feature for Kelly. We do have about 15 minutes um, before we will have to close this, but if you have any questions, please feel free to send it in because Kelly is opening this time for questions. So please send them in. And Kelly, can you see the... <clears throat> Yes. Okay. I think I can. I can pull up a thing that says question and answer. Okay, beautiful. <laughs> oh, and I see the chat, so I will open both. Okay. Oh, thank you, Mario. Yes, really important, right? Teaching versus coaching. So important to distinguish. And, you know, you can even call that out as you're in a conversation. Hey, I'm sorry, let's, let's step away from coaching for a minute. I'd like to teach you something. Awesome. And that one is challenging. Ooh, Nathan. So question, would you use these micro skills on each of the four steps of kata? What a great question. Um, yes, absolutely. And in fact, um, so repeat and add and slice the elephant are two that I have learned directly from practicing kata. But yes, absolutely, all four are you, or all five rather, are useful. So if we talk about um, why without why, so asking what and how uh, you can use during any phase when you're trying to zoom in on a process. So instead of saying, right, why is that happening? Why is that your process? You can go with, hey, so what is currently happening? How should you, how should the process run? How would you like it to run? What happens in that step? So yes, absolutely, in every phase, you can use all five. Repeat and add goes very nicely with all of the coaching questions. So what is your target condition if you don't get the answer that you're looking for? What's your target condition with respect to your process metrics, with respect to your outcome metrics? And the same through all of those, all of those phases. Excellent question. Ashley. Oh, so Ashley is asking, could you walk through another example of asking why without asking? Um, and what are the what's and how's to use? Yes, so let's, let me think of an example. So um, a team I'm working with here has been working through um, a quality issue. So let's use that. So let's assume you've got a defect in some process. Maybe let's, we'll make it generic to like my laundry. That was too many wrinkles. So the way that you would normally do five Y in that situation is you would say, okay, why does your laundry have too many wrinkles? And I might say, well, they sit in the basket for an hour. Okay, well, why do they sit in the basket for an hour after the dryer? Well, because I can't hear my all right, I take the laundry out and I put it down and set it on the, the counter every night at 9 p.m. and then I go to bed. Okay, well, why why do you set it on the counter instead of just doing it? And so that, that would be the traditional five why approach. So instead of asking why, right? So first question was, why is my laundry wrinkly? So I might ask, um, how does the process currently run to enable your laundry to be wrinkly, right? So instead of just, why is it wrinkly? How does the process run? So it zooms straight into process. The second is why does your laundry wait for an hour before you fold it? So instead I would maybe ask um, what as it stands now with respect to that laundry sitting. So how, how does, or what, what is that process? How does that process run? You could also go with what is your signal to start folding that laundry? Or what is your signal to take it from the basket and put it in this holding place? Um, so that's that's a way to do it. So the the question has more words in it, but the nature of the question just feels a little bit less like accusatory than a why question would. Ashley, I hope that that helps answer. Um, and then I oh thank you. And then I see in the chat, Miriam asked, I mentioned when the data does not speak to what we want to ask, what does the data look like in data points? Can I explain that how that gets us to what we want? Yes. So. Imagine for an instance that you have 
like a pie, a pie chart is probably an easy one to think about. So if you are given as a leader um, some data, a graphic that shows, hey, here's this pie chart, and I'm showing that this percentage of it is attributed to a certain problem. Um, that tells you something. What it, it tells you the magnitude of the problem you're solving. But if you're looking for how is that problem behaving over time, right? A pie chart, a pie chart is not going to tell you that. Really, you need to see that in data points day over day. So what you can, a way to use repeat and add in this to say, awesome, this is great. So what, what does this data set, what does this data look like in individual points over a period of time? Um, or alternatively, you can also, instead of like individual data points, sometimes is a weird wording to, to ask somebody, you can say, great, what does this data look like over time in a run chart? And that way you are asking them for a specific format so you can see those patterns and trends as opposed to just saying, go make me a run chart. Any other questions? These have been fabulous questions also. Yes, so thank yeah. you all for asking them. They've been really good. They've been awesome, awesome questions. I guess I will ask a quick question. Um, will this be available for participants in case they've forgotten what those skills are? Yes. So I will, I will send out a link to view the recording within 24 to 48 hours to everybody. Awesome. So don't be afraid if you, I, I, I talk kind of quickly, so don't be afraid if you didn't write everything down, you'll have that, that content information. Um, and I'm always available, but I always, I, I do sleep. But aside from that, I'm always available to help <laughs> answer questions. Okay. Let's see. I'm going to give, does anybody, can you guys raise your hand if you do have a question or a thought before I close it all out? Oh, we do have one. Okay. Oh, okay. This is a fabulous question. And goodness, Ashley, if we can all if we can all fix this together, then this world's going to be so much better. So Ashley's question is when coaching versus teaching, how do you land on the right question to ask? Like in that coaching mindset, how do you know? Right. And I think when I came into coaching, that was the I was like searching for this. How do I know? How do I know the right question? Because I feel like everybody I observe knows for some they've got a sixth sense for what the right question is to ask. I'm going to tell you a dirty little secret. Nobody knows. Nobody knows the right question to ask. The best thing you can do is practice. And honestly, in time, what I've learned is to just practice coaching. And you're really generally not coaching to help them solve their problem or to get them to, to get a person to the right solution, right? That's a nice benefit. But generally, coaching is more about how am I helping them think for themselves and think through this? So. What you need to think about is how is this person thinking? Are they thinking logically? Are they thinking scientifically? Do they have curiosity? How do I help them see that they need to go see? But not necessarily, I don't have to know the solution to this problem. I don't have to know the perfect path. I have to help them see the path. So that's something that can help you kind of de-stress a little bit about coaching. It's okay if you don't have the perfect question. Um, the the point is come in with curiosity. And if you practice enough and, and practice looking at how is this person thinking over, am I getting them to the perfect solution? You'll, you'll be in a much better place to be successful with your coaching. And so will your um, coachee as well. So it's really just get in there and practice and focus on how are they thinking. That really helps. And when you do identify a gap in, in knowledge that you can help close to teach, jump in and teach it. If you don't know, that's okay too. Get somebody to help uh, teach something that you might not know about or help them find the right person. 
So. And then I've got one one other question from Nathan, which is how can we reach out to you? What's the what's the plan here for sharing my information? So Kelly, I can include it in the email with the recording or Beautiful. if that's okay with you. Okay. Yeah, that's great. I'll make sure that you have so I'll I'll make sure that my um my email and um I'm on LinkedIn as well. I'm pretty active. So both of those places will make sure that, that that's available. And everybody, when I do send out the recording, look for Keller, Kelly's email. I will include that in the email as well. And awesome. we have um, about five minutes left. So um, if we want to do that, if you guys have another question, raise your hand real fast. That way we know you're typing something. Um, but if not, we will go ahead and let everybody get back to their day. Let's see. Okay, I think that is all. Kelly, thank you so much. You're always such a joy. And we look forward to seeing you at the Lean Coaching Summit in July. Yeah. And also, quick reminder, you will get a recording um, 24 to 48 hours with Kelly's information in it. And that is all. Kelly, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for joining in today's webinar.